Michael and uh, welcome everyone to this. Um, it's mainly a introduction session to uh, a series of um, lessons slash discussion groups uh, that I will be holding in uh, with the Toronto Beyond the Walls congregation over the next uh, eight weeks, but it's actually every two weeks that I'll be doing it. So, uh, so it's, uh, there's still two classes or two lessons or two group discussions that will be had before Christmas, one on Saturday and, uh, and then in two weeks time on Saturday. Uh, and then I'll get back to the times and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, the idea here is to look at community of Christ mission initiatives and how we can find them in the Book of Mormon. Or the other way around, somebody might say, is that how our community of Christ in mission initiatives also are uh, underlined uh, or em emanate from uh, an understanding or a particular reading of the Book of Mormon. So um, this is... This is uh, really the objective of this particular presentation today was to do an introduction. And then I will delve into each topic much deeper, hopefully much deeper. I don't know how much can be done in an hour of discussion, but we will delve into each, each of the topics that I will be presenting today uh, in terms of uh, future um, classes on Saturdays. So I'll just go straight to it and uh, we'll show you then my PowerPoint. Can everyone see this? We're good. Okay. So um, the Book of Mormon and Community of Christ Mission Initiatives. So as I said, which one came first? Uh, what we know is that uh, the Book of Mormon uh, was written in the uh, 1828 to 1829, and Community of Christ Mission Initiatives per se derived from a reading of Luke 4, uh, 16 or 16 to 19, uh, where Jesus is in the synagogue and proclaims uh, his mission statement. And that's how we have looked at the Christ mission being our mission. So what is this discussion group, or rather first, what it isn't? It's to prove the historicity of the Book of Mormon, to make you believe in or read even the Book of Mormon, or to convince you that community of Christ is the one and true church. These statements are uh, were not necessarily... Uh, I, I think that they're helpful to start with in a conversation about the Book of Mormon, just because of historic, historically where we have been as a church movement. Um, but what we are trying to do now is actually to ask ourselves the following, to consider how the Book of Mormon might help us in terms of mission, uh, to explore ways Community of Christ could use its messages or its stories within our Christian tradition, and to faithfully identify Jesus Christ of the New Testament within those stories. So those are really kind of the goal of these, uh, of these uh, classes here. Um, and then I thought of the main target audience, who, 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 who will be interested in talking about the Book of Mormon in Community of Christ? Well, some Community of Christ members with an aversion for the Book of Mormon, or who are as enthusiastic as others about it. <laughs> and then Latter-day Seekers who are seeking new ways to engage the Book of Mormon. So this is kind of the, the, the people I've tried to kind of think about when I was uh, um, preparing these particular classes. One uh, could also argue, like in Acts 4, 11 to 12, that Jesus is the stone you build is rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Well, when looking at the Book of Mormon, some might then say that 
uh, that has also been rejected and has in that sense now Jesus-like qualities. As a book of scripture, it speaks to a people that have become marginalized because of its use. So I, I just wanted to put that out there in terms of uh, the, the, the fact that it's a book of scripture that we, we've become less accustomed to in community of Christ. And we know that the, uh, uh, the LDS church, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is using this book much more. And that kind of has created some aversion for us in terms of should we use it? How should we use it? What can we use it for? So this is an exploration of a potential use of the Book of Mormon in Community of Christ. And then I wanted to go with a, a hymn. Uh, you'll see here the old, old path. Uh, and I have some reflection questions. I will not play the hymn for you now uh, just because of time, but uh, I want you to reflect on these two questions. The old, old path will be ever new. Why? Why will the old, old path be ever new? Uh, if anybody has an idea or wants to share, I mean, I, I'm been more than happy to hear some answers. When we sing these songs, yes, Mike. A path will disappear if it's not used. Mm. Interesting, yes. Anybody else? Yeah, my, yeah, it Michael. seems that the old old path is maybe a synonym for the way, and mm. uh, almost everything with Jesus is is new. You know, there's a newness to what will what will come, what can happen. Yes, we never uh, know who we'll meet on the old old path. <laughs> That's lovely. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Grace uh, and Claire. Just this idea of continuous revelation. We can mm -hmm. never say we're there or we've got it. It's a, a continual journey for us. Yes. So now what does it mean to fearlessly walk with the Nazarene also when reading the Book of Mormon? What am I trying to get to here? Is anybody... Uh, anybody has a thought? Our, uh, um, you know, guiding question is, are we moving towards Jesus, the peaceful one? Mm -hmm. And is the Book of Mormon helping us do that? And yeah. what parts of the Book of Mormon are helping us do that? Thank you. That's very helpful. And it's a good guiding question in terms of where we are now uh, as a movement. Uh, and, and, uh, and then when we read the Book of Mormon, the question then is, does it help us really get closer to Jesus or not? Uh, and, and not only Jesus, but what type of Jesus, what kind of Jesus are we seeking here? Uh, so what I like here uh, with the fearlessly walk with the Nazarene personally, for me is that when I read the Book of Mormon, I need to think of the Jesus of the New Testament uh, in order to understand better some of the passages that we are, that I might, that Joseph Smith is exploring ultimately through his narrative theology uh, in the 19th century America. Uh, so, so this is kind of, um, if we are walking with Jesus, we do not need to fear what might happen as we read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm trying to say here. Um, so the Book of Mormon is part of our tradition and it is part of our canon of scripture. Uh, the, it is also the founding event of the restoration uh, according to Dale, Dale Luffman. Um, and, and I, just, I just found that interesting when, when I was reading his book that he, 
he, uh, he ultimately says that in terms chronologically, uh, you have the, um, uh, the story of Joseph Smith in the woods uh, having a first vision experience or a sacred grove experience uh, was recounted or told after the Book of Mormon had uh, itself been recorded. So, so in, in, in essence, people who were meeting uh, the Church of Christ at the time in, in the 1830s um, were uh, discovering uh, were discovering first and foremost the Book of Mormon. So thus it becomes the founding event of, of the restoration per se. So I, I, in fearlessly walking with the Nazarene when reading the Book of Mormon, I do ask myself three questions. How do I use it responsibly? Right? It's about responsible choices, but also about uh, Doctrine and Covenants 163, we have uh, uh, verse 7 that kind of tells us that no scripture uh, should be used to diminish or oppress or, or uh, cause hurt to any people, right? Uh, I, now I'm paraphrasing, but, but there is something about the responsible use of scripture. And then since we've kind of, uh, and, and one way to do that, and that I suggest here, is to use the biblical Jesus of the gospels as an interpretative lens. Then the second question is, how do I repurpose its use? And I say, well, we've been using it up until the 1960s, 70s, and 80s uh, to a large degree. Uh, but now in 21st century, is there still a reason to explore a 19th century document. Uh, you know, it's one theologian out of several, right? I mean, it's Joseph Smith, uh, and who was a young man at the time as well, and whose theology to a certain uh, degree evolved over time and et cetera, et cetera. So why, why should I uh, repurpose the use of the Book of Mormon? So what I'm proposing is actually that this is a Jesus story or the, the Christ event of the, of the New Testament that is being reimagined as a 19th century American folktale. And what I'm hoping is here to see that this can prove useful as we approach the Book of Mormon. What kind of book, what, what kind of book or what kind of tale is the Book of Mormon? And then finally, uh, the third question I'm asking myself is, can its mes message inform our mission? So, and, and the idea here is that a faithful interpretation of the Book of Mormon would have to reflect our peace and justice mission today in Community of Christ for it to make any sense. And I'm, I mean, to be honest, I don't... <laughs> I, I really don't think I have all the answers to these three questions. These are propositions, uh, my own perhaps theological propositions, and also um, knowing perfectly well that there are many other ways of approaching the Book of Mormon, uh, and, um, and that this is a debatable or contested uh, arena in terms of our own theology and community of Christ. So, but this, these three things for me is important, is the biblical Jesus, uh, looking at the biblical Jesus in its American 19th century context, and then today in the 21st century, it needs to be applied to our peace and justice mission if we are gonna have any use of it. Now, going to, I mean, now I've kind of feel I've done some of the pre-packaging <laughs> of, of this presentation. Uh, and I just need to make sure that I, I'm on time as well. Yeah, it's okay. So the Book of Mormon, we proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of hope, joy, love, and peace. Uh, we're familiar with that mission statement. Uh, it is ours and community of Christ. Uh, and uh, the way I've kind of look at it is that there are like 
uh, these two boxes. Uh, one is come unto Christ and the other bring forth Zion. Uh, it's another way of kind of looking at uh, who we are proclaiming and what we are promoting. And uh, the Book of Mormon's call to come unto Christ uh, is a call of repentance. It is an invitation to lay down our weapons of war and be saved. Uh, and to bring forth Zion, to me, is to build Zion in a modern land of promise. You would have to, and that modern land of promise is not just America for me. It's, you know, we are, <laughs> we are in Europe here. But it's, it's, you would have to address poverty. You have to address the marginalization of mo uh, minorities, etc. So like, uh, like Evan said, are we moving towards Jesus, the peaceful one? This is really a central question when it comes to the Book of Mormon. And then here is a thought process that I just wanted to kind of, this is the 21st century, right? Virtual reality. We're all sitting in our different uh, living rooms at the moment and looking at each other uh, through a screen. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> I just love this picture of this man who is probably fighting a war somewhere in, uh, in his virtual reality. Uh, and, and I just wanted to use that picture to kind of ask myself the question, if I were to recontextualize the Jesus story in the Americanized and globalized 21st century context, what would serve as a basis for that, that story? So if I took the Jesus story and what Jesus is telling us in the New Testament, and I want to kind of reappropriate or reimagine this story in my current context instead of having to go back 2000 years what what would i how would i include jesus in my current life what stories would i be telling if it wasn't just the new testament stories anybody has any thoughts on that yes michael seems it would need to be um located maybe where there is empire or a superpower and also places where there are oppressed people. Right, you know, because that, those are the kind of uh, the dichotomies, if you want, in, in, in the New Testament. You have an empire, the Roman Empire, and you have oppressed people, uh, the Jewish people of the time, uh, uh, in which Jesus is born and, and then... Uh, and, and, and then that dichotomy ultimately creates the tension, the conflict, uh, and the, the, the possibility for God to redeem mankind or redeem humankind, right? So, so this, is, this is why I think the Book of Mormon is attractive, because it has that kind of, well, it is written in King James Version language, King James language, but but it is the Jesus story put in a 19th century American context, even though it claims not to be a 19th century American book, but rather an ancient book in the Americas in which Jesus appeared to. Uh, but I, I love that kind of uh, what, what ultimately the Book of Mormon then gives us is a gift in terms of bringing us up to uh, a, a 21st century context, which is only 200 years later, and start thinking about what that would look like. Um, does that make sense? Or, or am, I, am I kind of losing people at this stage? Every, it makes sense to me because, you know, I was just thinking, if you asked me to put the Jesus story in Australia, where I've never been, um, it would be difficult for me. Um, uh, not difficult, it would be impossible for me. Um, and, and I think probably you, you would tend to, if, if we were asked to do that, we tend to put Jesus someplace near where we live or someplace that we're familiar with. Mm. So maybe the Australian version would have Jesus entering Brisbane on a kangaroo. 
<laughs> which of course doesn't make any sense but in a way it does make sense because that's the way you know things might be done in australia providing again i don't know anything really about australia right uh gail i see you raised the hand yeah yeah you know i have to be honest with everybody i've seen this stuff i've talked with elray about this stuff before um but what Mike just said really makes me think, how would it be done here in Europe? What would we really do? And I think here in Europe, it would be Jesus in his peaceful moments and not the street preacher that is present in the New Testament. I think it would be Jesus quietly and peacefully calling things out. And it would look different if we did that for each continent. And it's a brilliant idea. Well, what I'm trying to illustrate is actually that Joseph Smith in, in, in some way uh, takes the story of Jesus that he's familiar with through reading the Bible and places it in his own context which suddenly makes it relevant uh, to the people around him. It's, uh, and that, that's kind of uh, what I will be saying about the origins of the book and how it might be used today. But, uh, but in terms of Community of Christ Mission Initiatives, let's delve a bit into that. Um, so what are Community of Christ Mission Initiatives? Uh, and like I said, we, we got to them in terms of Luke 4, 16 to 19, uh, which is Jesus reads a passage from Isaiah uh, in uh, the synagogue uh, where he declares pretty much his mission uh, as inviting people uh, to uh, sacred community to be with him uh, in abolishing poverty and end suffering, pursue peace on and for the earth develop disciples to serve and experience congregations in missions in mission this is this is our interpretation of luke 4 16 to 19 right we've kind of put some mission initiatives to to try to capture this liberating the captives uh proclaiming good news to the poor and declare uh uh the lord's year you know so the favor of the of, of the lord's year so anyway um that's kind of who, what is a, a community of Christ mission initiatives are. And then in terms of uh, each of them, I focused mainly this, this presentation on the top three, uh, which is invite people to Christ, abolish poverty and suffering and pursue peace on and for the earth. And I will start with uh, abolishing poverty and end suffering. because uh, an author called Nathan Hatch, who is uh, an outsider to our movement, but wrote fantastically about it in uh, The Democratization of American Christianity, a great book that uh, we had uh, in seminary, pretty much says that the single most striking theme of the Book of Mormon is abolishing poverty. I mean, it's abolishing the inequalities between rich and poor. And he says, it is the rich and the proud and the learned who find themselves in the hands of an angry God. Throughout the book, evil is most often depicted as the result of pride and worldliness that comes from economic success and results in the oppression of the poor. Which is a fantastic analysis. When I read that, I was like, "Wow, that's that's pretty powerful and and very spot on in terms of our own theme or our own mission initiatives to abolish poverty and end suffering." Uh, and I wanted to find a Book of Mormon scripture that would illustrate this particular point. Uh, and I found one in Second Nephi six sixty two to sixty four that says. But woe unto the rich who are rich as to the things of the world. For because they are rich, they despise the poor and they persecute the meek and their hearts are upon their treasures. 
wherefore their treasure is their God. And behold, their treasure shall perish with them also. And I, I mean, very powerful, very, very striking scripture here. Um, and also a huge departure for Joseph Smith, who was ultimately a treasure digger, you know, a treasure hunter, you know, to kind of go and say then uh, at this point, actually, uh, you know, their treasure is their God and behold, their treasure shall perish with them also. So there is a huge departure probably either in Joseph's mind or in, in what he's trying to put forward here. But fearlessly walking with Jesus of Nazareth, you know, how do we do that? And then, and then I had to ask myself the question in the New Testament, how did Jesus and his followers challenge the economic system of their day? So the picture itself is a bit self-revealing in terms of what I'm trying to get at. But I think there are many examples in the, in the, the New Testament about Jesus's take on the economic structures of his day. Um, and uh, if Jesus wasn't challenging the economics of ancient Palestine, uh, then I, I doubt that, that, that we would, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I, I doubt we would have, had the, the kind of outcome that Jesus then had, which was to, to end up in terms of uh, uh, killed, crucified, and, and, and then the final outcome, which we have now is, is, is the resurrection. So, um, so anyway, any thoughts here about, about this? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a bit, you know, fishing for question here. I mean, for, for comments, but any comments on this one? I think uh, Jesus dealing with the money changers is one of my favorite parts of the New Testament. And so I like that you're connecting it to uh, the, the theme of economic oppression in the Book of Mormon. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that strikes me also is when he says, uh, you know, you've made it, you've turned the temple or you turned my, the house or, or I don't know, the exact wording uh, escapes me, but you've turned the house of God into a den of thieves or a den of robbers, depending on which translation we read that. And I, I, I think it's always fascinating to think that there are Gadianton robbers in the Book of Mormon around the time of Jesus's apparition. Uh, that, that, so, so for me, the, the robbers theme is actually quite, uh, pre prevalent in the Book of Mormon and becomes uh, and is a theme in Jesus's kind of rebuke of what is happening. But I, I turn to actually Acts 4 uh, in terms of uh, finding uh, uh, a, a creative new way for dealing with possessions. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken when, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed were his own, but they had all things common. So all things common for me is actually kind of like uh, a new way to talk about abolishing poverty and uh, and suffering. Um, of course, it's it's kind of like uh, you take one word or one phrase from the the Bible, and you amplify that. You kind of uh, <laughs> you know scream it across the pages of the Book of Mormon, and that's what what you get. You get a, a book that is uh, shocked at um, at the kind of injustices that exist in, in society. Uh, and, and for me, that is one way to kind of approach the Book of Mormon is to look at this striking theme, right? The first striking theme. 
because we find that again in fourth nephi so in the in the passage where jesus then has appeared to the 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 people of the book of mormon and uh and this is what happens the people were all converted to the lord all all over the land but nephites and lamanites and there were no contentions and disputations among them. And every man dealt justly one with another. And they had all things common among them. Therefore, they were not rich and poor, bond and free. But they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. If there is a single scripture in the Book of Mormon that puts uh, everything else in the Book of Mormon on its head, <laughs> or that has uh, that has everything in the Book of Mormon prepare us for this particular revelation or understanding of acts. It's, I mean, it's this one, you know, it's the, the, this is the trajectory where we get to, ah, this is what the Book of Mormon is really trying to tell us. You know, establishing Zion or the, the, of one heart and one mind that is referred to in in acts four uh evan i saw your hand yeah i often tell people that uh, the climax of the book of mormon isn't when christ comes and teaches everyone the climax of the book of mormon is fourth nephi these verses here because this is when everybody finally has the message that christ has been trying to get across and it clicks with everybody and that's the climax mm. Thank you, Evan. So, so I'm taking this all things common phrase and I was going to ask ourselves, what does having all things common mean to you? Right? Anybody have any thoughts of having all things in common? <laughs> How does that, re yes, Rachel. Sorry, do you think perhaps it goes deeper than just things? Do you think perhaps it's talking also about um, the fact that we're all human and we're all children of God? Yes, it does. I mean, it does that in the, the verse, I would say. But, but for me, I, I, I've, I've taken, in terms of economic inequality, I've taken that particular phrase out because the others, I will use them in the other mission initiatives. So, so, so but I, I do appreciate the thought that this has perhaps more to do ab about who and how we consider each other. Uh, um, but there is something about, uh, you know, the, the picture that I, I've, I've chosen for this particular uh, having all things in common is actually communion or the Lord's Supper, where, where Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. Um, and we then became, we become all then partakers of the heavenly gift. And as we become partakers of the heavenly gift, we then want to gift to each other our own lives, our own things, our own ways of being, right? So this is kind of like, uh, how does communion and the Lord's Supper teach us uh, about economic equality? So it's linking probably one of our sacraments to a very important uh, aspect of sharing what we have with others. So how does this understanding of God's kingdom challenge ideas you might hold about economic control and the concentration of economic power in the hands of a few? Yes, Mike. Yeah, I really like what uh, Rachel just said, because, you know, having all things in common or being or being equal has so much to do with the power structures that exist in, in many societies. And so it's not just giving bread and wine to other people and taking care of their hunger, but it would be abolishing racism and sexism and any other negativism that, that's out there so um yeah i think i think the, what rachel said is going 
deeper is, is very important in the understanding um, that's more than just um, economic equality. Because you have to destroy um, things like racism and sexism, which keeps us from having economic equality. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, what you're saying is totally right, and I, I agree with it. It's it's um, probably the reason I'm I'm sticking to <laughs> to to this particular explanation is just because uh, economic uh, inequality uh, is. <laughs> is considered at least in the Book of Mormon and probably uh, in in places in the New Testament as a, as one of the sins or the separations that keep us from having a more peaceful and just society. So, but yes, I saw Ken here. Yeah, I think that having all things common doesn't necessarily mean having everything the same. I think everyone has what they need to live, to um, be a useful person within the society in which they live. Um, in other words, there's no greed or thing, everything is shared and they take as they have need of, um, as opposed to um, everyone having the same. Mm. So just for a Community of Christ audience here, how does, how does we, uh, how does living in reunion together uh, have an impact on how we look at economics within within a community. You know this this all things in common. How do we live in when we are in family reunion together, so that we actually, I mean, we we actually experience this Zion quality, right, of of economic equality. I. Uh my mind keeps wandering to experience congregations and mission. Mm -hmm. um, one of the themes in the Book of Mormon, you also mentioned there's separation. Um, a lot of this economic oppression in the Book of Mormon starts happening when there's a separation from others. Um, and it's a lot harder to hate someone when you're friends with them. Um, when you know them on a personal level and everything like that. And, um, you know, I, I always point back to the name of our church. Our name was, so, uh, we mindfully chose our name uh, 20 years ago. And the concept of community was so important to us that we put it in our name. And so when we lose that community, um, that sense of togetherness, um, oppression happens. And it happens not only within our church, but, you know, in the wider, um, you know, economic systems, national systems and everything like that. So. Yeah. So I, I'm just thinking, you know, I, what you said is great because it's like, you know, would you deny your friend anything that he might stand in need of? <laughs> versus a complete stranger right and then that is just a, a stranger is a friend you haven't met yet right i mean is that's kind of the other that's the other take on it so i'm i'm just you know it's it's interesting how we've kind of thought about our economics in terms of um who we know and how how we are organized in society. But anyway, I'm not gonna go into too deep on the economic side because there's a whole lesson that I'm gonna try and, and focus on that uh, on, on Saturday. Uh, but let's move on to uh, another striking theme. So Patrick Q. Mason is a, is a LDS author uh, who studied uh, violence and Mormonism in particular, and he says that numerous authors have concluded that the Book of Mormon should be understood as an anti-war text. How can this be when so much of the book is dedicated to war stories? Some of the book's major heroes, such as Captain Moroni, are warriors, and the book's three narrators, Nephi, Mormon, and Moroni, all relied on the sword as well as the pen. 
So I, I just think that that's a fun quote. Uh, well, one of my answers to that question, uh, which uh, is rhetorical, is really uh, Third Nephi 5, 57 to 59, where Jesus pretty much teaches the Sermon on the Mount. And blessed are all they who are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For you shall have great joy and be exceedingly glad, for great shall be your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. So this is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, right? But, but I, I'm, I'm always, uh, again, fascinated that Jesus comes and establishes peace between a people that's been heavily divided by war for centuries. This is kind of the main story, really, the main storyline of the Book of Mormon. And that's why it's a striking theme. It's just interesting that, you know, most people will go there in terms of the Book of Mormon rather than go uh, in terms of economic inequality. Uh, but uh, one follows with the other. Um, you know, uh, and, and I, I just think that this is an interesting other striking theme to consider. So how did Jesus and his followers challenge the culture of violence of their day? Any thoughts of that? If we go back to Jesus, the, the Nazarene. What was the culture of violence of their day? I mean, it was the Roman Empire. Uh, when uh, the woman was about to be stoned, Jesus said, um, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And that was a pretty big message to all the other folks there of, you know, you're not blameless either. And then Jesus, who was the one person who could throw the stone, uh, turned around and forgave the woman. Mm. Also, yes, Gail. Uh, sorry, Gail was first there. Gail? I was, I was thinking about this in terms of Jesus' whole attitude spiritually and I haven't fully connected this so take it for what it is I think we are challenged as a whole to walk with the Nazarene in peace because ultimately we see him not only forgiving the woman and calling it out, but we also see him fleeing the violence of the times and going into the desert to pray, actually escaping from the, Ro the Roman Empire in its day. I don't know if that's clear. I, I'm still making the thought gel, but he uh, left. He abandoned places of violence to seek places of peace in contemplation. Hmm. So I, I'm just gonna take us to the two scriptures in Luke 22 and John 18. I hope you can read this, but uh, when Jesus's followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest cutting off his right ear his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched a man's ear and healed him. So we know it's, this, I mean, this, this story of, of, of Jesus healing the ear of the servant that came to arrest him is pretty powerful. Uh, there is one of the early church fathers who said that by disarming Peter, uh, Jesus disarmed all of us, you know. Um, and then Jesus said, in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight 
to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is, not, is, from, is from another place. And then Pilate says, you are a king then. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So, so these, are, these are powerful scriptures to me about the purpose of, uh, uh, of how Jesus challenges uh, the culture of violence and counter violence that existed in, in the old, in uh, 2000 years ago. Um, so can we find that in the Book of Mormon? Uh, I've gone a bit untra uh, untraditionally with uh, a third Nephi 8 scripture juxtaposed to a Mormon, uh, the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, uh, chapter 2 uh, scripture. Um, and and I, I hope you will see why I, I have juxtaposed these two scriptures. One is Jesus has has been has been praying and saying wonderful things and the narrator of the book then says and no tongue can speak neither can they be written by any man neither can the hearts of men conceive so great and marvelous things as we both saw and heard Jesus speak and no one can conceive of the joy which filled our souls at the time we heard him pray for us to the father when Jesus had made an end of praying to the father he arose but so great was the joy of the multitude that they were overcome. And then I juxtapose that with what is becoming of the Book of Mormon people at the end. It is impossible for the tongue to describe or for man to write perfect description of the horrible scene of the blood and carnage which was among the people, both of the Nephites and the Lamanites. And every heart was hardened so that they delighted in shedding of blood continually. And there were never has been so great wickedness among all the children of Lehi, nor even among all the house of Israel, as was among this people. So for me, this is really a striking theme. You know, it's a, it's a striking comparison between the Jesus uh, the experience of being with Jesus and the peace and joy that is being felt there versus what happens when you abandon that road, when you abandon the old path, right? Um, so, so that's kind of why I'm putting these two uh, scriptures up against each other. Any thoughts on this matter or any... Any feelings about this? No. So I'll keep on going. So in the Book of Mormon, we then see that the motivation for not resisting in kind, uh, even in 4th Nephi 137, which is where things start deteriorating, after the 200 years of peace, right? And they smote the people of Jesus, but the people of Jesus did not smite again. So there is a very clear understanding here in the Book of Mormon that non-retaliation is definitely uh, an important value of being the people of Jesus. Um, So using the same setup as, as uh, the conclusion, in your own words, what does loving your enemies mean now to you? And how does this understanding of God's kingdom challenge ideas you might hold about the use of force and violence in establishing peace through victory over others? So I'll just leave it as a reflection question, perhaps as we move towards conclusion. I have a few more minutes. Uh, so this is this was the second mission initiative. So pursue peace on uh, on the earth. And then the third for me, which is about um, 
uh, which is about inviting people to Christ. And I have a picture of Moses here first, is because the Book of Mormon also stands in the Exodus tradition. It's very much, it, it very much looks back towards Exodus. It has its own Exodus from Jerusalem, uh, its own departure out into the wilderness, its own sought seeking after the land of promise and its own desire for liberty, freedom from bondage. Uh, and, and that is, uh, God has a role to play in that. God intervenes in history for that. So that's why I'm saying that the Book of Mormon stands in the Exodus tradition. And uh, to, for that purpose, I, Alma, um, In Alma, we can read, for he has brought our fathers out of Egypt and he has swallowed up the Egyptians in the Red Sea and he led them by his power into the promised land. And he has delivered them out of bondage and captivity from time to time. And he has also brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem. And he has also by his everlasting power delivered them out of bondage and captivity from time to time, even down to the present day. So this is actually the, the idea I had in terms of uh, also violence, but also human conventions uh, and the law of Moses. I mean, uh, you know, that was given to the people uh, and that Jesus and his followers challenged somehow some of the conventions to set themselves and others free. So, so I, I use this story to kind of uh, think about how uh, Jesus then uh, turned things around by using the law to uh, free ourselves, you know, thinking more of the spirit of the law rather than of the letter. Um, so when it comes to uh, freedom in that term, uh, freedom uh, from the law, but uh, uh, it's, it's um, I, I've kind of looked at Galatians here and juxtaposed it with 2 Nephi 11. Uh, and here we see that in Galatians, there is an emphasis on unity. In uh, 2 Nephi, it uses a similar kind of uh, uh, imagery uh, although one is clothed in Christ and the other is come unto Christ and partake of his goodness uh, because Christ denies none that come to him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembers the hidden and all are alike to God, both Jew and Gentile. So this is kind of uh, where we find the worth of all persons, right? Uh, in some way, initially in the Book of Mormon, this is, this is a... a a, a way that when we start seeing ourselves as uh, clothed in Christ, we start seeing ourselves no longer as divided or different or uh, separate from each other. Uh, and when we come unto Christ, we realize that no other should be denied to come unto Christ because we, we gain that same grace uh, and generosity that Christ, uh, that Christ shows us. So this is about the change perspective that we mentioned in Doctrine and Covenants 164, I think, uh, you know, that, that really uh, teaches us about um, how we ought to be seeing each other. And then I, I take us back to that fourth Nephi one, th three and four, which men mentions here now that they were all made free in, on uh, line six, that they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. And there were great and marvelous works wrought by the disciples of Jesus in so much that they healed the sick and raised the dead and caused the lame to walk and the blind to receive the sight and the deaf to hear. So Gail, you had your hand up. Uh, you want to say something? Not that I know that I had my hand up. If I did, oh. it's a surprise. Sorry. Okay. No, no, that's fine. So all were made free. 
here I'm focusing again on a on one one particular phrasing uh, in in the New Testament, but uh, it it for me it, it just shows here uh, it it's like three initiations like baptism all early converts become heirs to the kingdom, and this suddenly turns the kingdom into something of uh, the kingdom where we are all free. We are all heirs to the kingdom, that freedom that, that Christ can give. Um, so, uh, of course, this I will go deeper into in the third lesson that I, I will be exploring uh, in terms of freedom and how the Book of Mormon also talks about freedom. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting, I think it's an interesting Thing. I'm, I'm linking it to Jesus and coming unto Jesus, but there are many ways in which freedom is talked about in the Book of Mormon because it's a very American concept uh, of the 19th century uh, and that continues to this day. So, uh, and I think that that is one of the, for me, one of the difficult ones to kind of untangle and to make sure that I, I am sticking to Jesus here. So this is why I've, I've shown you these scriptures in first uh, so that we, we have uh, Jesus and Jesus is the freedom that Jesus offers as kind of a, a forefront in our minds when we talk about inviting people to Christ. Um, so uh, coming to towards a conclusion, uh, we see that... Uh, a great and marvelous work is about to come forth is that is really the Book of Mormon's way of talking about Zion, uh, about the, the positive, wonderful things that uh, could happen if the people turn toward Jesus, if the people uh, sought the welfare of creation and of each other. Uh, and, uh, and actually, these are found in Isaiah. So how important are the words of Isaiah, as the Book of Mormon kind of says? Uh, uh, you have in Isaiah 11, Eden restored. In Isaiah 2, the swords into, the swords into plow, plowshares. And then Isaiah 61, a liberated people. Um, so here's the conclusion. You know, three promises in the 21st century. Where are you now in terms of sharing what you have generously? Where are you now in terms of choosing peace over violence? Where are you now in terms of influencing others for good? So I'm just going to leave that there and stop sharing. And we can have a conversation. Sorry, or it's exactly eight. So if people have to leave at this point, I understand. <laughs> Anybody wants to have a little conversation here? I'm. Well, where where are you interested in going in that? Because I've been thinking about what you're saying, and I'm stuck back in Rome, or Roman times, at the time of Jesus, and thinking about how violent it was, mm. and how in the Book of Mormon the peace was emphasized obviously the wars are there but also the peace of what jesus did is more emphasized than the violence of where he lived mm -hmm. that's what keeps coming back to my mind yeah so well that's an in interesting reflection and and uh uh, one way that I've kind of thought about this is that um, the Jesus of the Book of Mormon is not necessarily the same Jesus or the, the, the Jesus that surrounds himself with fishermen and, uh, you know, uh, disciples who were farmers, perhaps, and others uh, in, in Palestine. It's actually a Jesus who ends up uh, you know, the Book of Mormon uh, uh, talks about the disciples of Jesus as warriors, 
uh, military people, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I think that the Book of Mormon is, is really aimed not only towards uh, the 19th century America, where they were, uh, there was a culture of, of violence, uh, but also towards our own globalized society today, where militaries and, and others are um, caught up in cultures of violence. Uh, where we set up ranks, uh, you know, uh, and divide ourselves according to ranks, which is also a kind of a, uh, in classes, uh, it's just a different way, word of saying classes in the Book of Mormon. But um, anyway, that, that's kind of one of the ways I've been thinking about it, is that it was, the Book of Mormon was aimed for our time in that sense, in, in for the 19th century. Um, as the New Testament was aimed for New Testament readers, you know, for those who were hearing the word in the first, second century. So, so that's kind of my, my take, uh, take on it. I don't know if that helps on your thought. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, somebody who comes from the LDS tradition and then is now community of Christ, you know, the 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 book of scripture um most of my life was used as a uh, you know a proof of uh, the status of the united states as a promised land a land of uh, of prosperity in a lot of ways and and that i always had a real hard time with that especially after i served my lds mission abroad because it was i found myself offending <laughs> spanish people by speaking about the book of scripture, and we're talking about LDS, Spanish people, um, the way that I had learned uh, about, about this book, um, it, even though these people were highly, highly attached to this book of scripture too. And as a 19 year old, that really made me start to rethink the way that I had been taught by my, my own family and my own congregation uh, about this book of scripture. Today, I think that it's, it, it's highly prophetic for our times, um, it, as, because it is placed on the American continent. It's, it, the U.S. Is, is empire today. It is a super power. And I think that it, it shows what can be using that place as an example for all people, um, for peace and for Nephi. And then as soon as we end with Moroni, we see real, real um, consequences that come if we don't heed the peaceful kingdom. Um, you know, we, instead of transformation, we, we run into the possibility of annihilation. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mike. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, um, it's getting things to, to, to move in my head. Um, at the time of Christ, um, it was the Romans who were mainly the the um, the cause of violence, and the Book of Mormon. Um, it's it's a civil war. It's not an, an, an being occupied by a foreign country. It's a civil war. So they're they're fighting against each other, and maybe in our times we have to recognize who our so-called enemies are so we can make them not our enemies. Um, so, so we're not dealing with, with so much with, with um, violence as in a war, but with violence against nature, with violence um, against minorities, um, etc. And like I said, not violence necessarily of killing someone with a sword, but maybe killing them with with um, with inequalities or destruction of, of creation, etc. And and try and, and use what we learned from the Bible and from the Book of Mormon on equality and uh, peaceful kingdom is to recognize what we need to do in our world nowadays. Hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate both of your thoughts. I mean, this is uh, um, this is the 
the tough part, right? Going into the 21st century and saying, how does this apply to, to our day? And, and how do we see anything from, from what we read in the Book of Mormon as pertinent to the problems of society today? Uh, and if it, if it doesn't help for mission, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't help us, right? I mean, it, it, if it doesn't bring us closer to Jesus, the peaceful one, then it's not helpful. Um, but uh, what I find interesting and, and uh, perhaps uh, is that if you do read it through the lens of empire, you have the people of empire who are the ones who are writing about what went wrong in their society. So, so it's actually the normally in history, right? You get the story or the history of the victors. Uh, that's what we that's what we kind of say. But the history of victors is the one that becomes the official narrative afterwards. But in this case, the Book of Mormon is not uh, the history of the victors. It's the history of the losers and their way of looking at how uh, they. Uh, built empire in some way uh, and fought others in terms of empire building and empires competing with each other. So I think it's more than civil war. I think it's really two empires and, and several different small nations fighting each other within the context of empire. It is not clearly said, and the word empire is never used in the Book of Mormon, but when you, uh, when you think of the 19th century context in which it was written the british empire was you know from from one side of the globe to the other and america had just fought a war of freedom uh, a revolution against it so so uh so joseph smith comes in the 1820s and starts writing about uh his own context uh and, and tries to see the Jesus story in that context. And for me, that's why the concept of empire is still helpful in reading the Book of Mormon, because here is the empire that actually has fallen. Um, the Nephites, you know, the rise and fall of empires. And here the Book of Mormon talks about the Nephite empire being a fallen empire at the end. And they are writing the story about, oh guys, this went really wrong. Uh, what can we do to, uh, and what can we do and say to you who are in the modern time about how you ought to live your lives and how you ought to stay uh, on the straight and narrow path that leads to Jesus, the old path. So, yeah, I mean, that's, mm. that's kind of, uh, the Book of Mormon kind of can be very sobering reading in that sense. You know, it's, it's, it's like, if, if, if it is read with that lens, I think. One of the things that always strikes me about the Book of Mormon is it is written by the Nephites. And so oftentimes the Nephites paint themselves in a better light than I think they really deserve. Um, the the racial tensions that exist in the Book of Mormon are always very striking to me. Um, the Nephites always the Nephites are white supremacists in the Book of Mormon, and um, they think they're better than the Lamanites because of that, and that's reflected through in the Book of Mormon. And growing up, I was always taught, you know, the Nephites are the good guys, the Nephites are the good guys. But it's just written from the perspective of the Nephites. They're not necessarily good guys when you take a step back um, and look at them um, in regards to that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and which, which, which good guys are actually uh, promoted in the text in terms of prophetic message or prophetic role that they play. It's people like Abinadi who appear on the scene of the Nephite people as a Nephite himself and says, why are we killing Lamanites? And then it's the Samuel the Lamanite who comes and says, why are you killing my people? Uh, you know, so, so it's, <laughs> these are uh, even, I, I, I mean, 
uh, the prophetic quality of these two characters in the Book of Mormon is kind of like the two ones that kind of make the point that the Book of Mormon is, is anti-war. It's, it's actually um, very concerned about what uh, war does to a people uh, in terms of their spirituality, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, their lives and, and uh, you know, and, and inequalities that, that follow from it. So, yeah. Well, I don't want to take more time, uh, Michael, if... Uh... Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elray, very much for being willing to come and to present. Um, Elray, do you want to tell people if they want to follow your continued lessons through Beyond the Walls, you want to tell them how to do that? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so this Saturday at 4 p.m., uh, CET time, so the European time, I will having a discussion group on the first uh, mission initiative that I talked about today, which was abolish poverty and end suffering. Um, I'm actually quite happy that I managed to go quite through all three of them today, uh, relatively uh, deep already. Uh, but however, uh, we will look at some other stories in the Book of Mormon that make the point. So, uh, so uh, for those who can and want to join in in that discussion group, this will be a continuation of what I've done today. And Elray, how, how do they connect to that? So you go to the Beyond the Walls uh, Facebook group and there should be uh, an event that is set up there. If it's not there yet, it will be soon. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I think the, the Zoom link is free. I mean, it's open. Uh, okay. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. And thank if you. you can't find, if you can't find it now, it will be there tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for to being with us, and um, thank you for coming from all over the world to, to hear this great presentation. Everyone's always welcome to the Disciples Toolbox and any other event at um, Community Circle. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.